is Wes Hagen, and welcome to Day Drinking. We are here uh, at least uh, four, if not five times a week to talk about all the things that we love to talk about in the world of alcohol. That is uh, general wine. We also talk a little bit about beer and spirits, and I answer all science types of questions. And John knows the rules. I always like to know exactly what, how long uh, was the Broadway Deli open, Mark? I'm totally curious. And, uh, and it's always good to know that the Sandy Chardonnay uh, is in the house. Um, you know, I think uh, obviously um, those wines are spectacular and a totally different uh, view of the Santa Rita Hills and how lucky are we to have winemakers as, as diverse as the Brewer Cliff, you know, Brewer Clifton, you know, Tyler, uh, Sandy, uh, um, you know, uh, Domaine de la Cote. I mean, uh, if you haven't had the Lavoie wines, by the way, from Steve Clifton, Steve Clifton's new uh, project, uh, well, new, it's like five years old now, but um, you know, it takes me a little while to catch up. All right, so I am jumping in. It is day drinking. So if you haven't been here before, let me tell you what the show's about. So on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we have a slightly deeper dive into certain subjects about wine. So Mondays are generally general wine education. Wednesdays are generally about making wine and uh, and growing grapes. And then on Friday, either we have sort of an open uh, open forum or it's a little more focused on hospitality. Eddie Gray, Eddie, uh, as you're watching this stuff on uh, uh, Jay Wilkes Wines uh, SB, uh, let me know if the audio and the uh, video continue to have problems because I know it was a little bit shaky uh, yesterday. So I've reset my internet. I have uh, restart restarted my... Uh, uh, my computer, but it seems like I'm still seeing it kind of 20 years. Yeah. Tripled the rent. Uh, what did they put in? Is that like, is that the new, that's not the new Wally's, is it? Uh, wondering, oh, and some Oregon Pinot Gris. That's awesome, Teresa. It's one place where actually Pinot Gris makes a pretty good wine. I'm not really a big fan of cheap, cheap Pinot Gris. Oh, good. Thank you, Jolie. Thank you, Eddie. Oh, that's my first I can honestly say that's my first sip of the day. I didn't get the opportunity to do any tasting notes today. Um, I would say maybe two to three days out of the week, I'll have a lineup of wines that I need to taste and make some and make some stuff, uh, some notes on. And we're, we will. I already told you guys we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, wine tasting notes. And uh, Mark Zeidler being a wine judge at the LA County Fair and many other competitions for longer than I've been a wine judge, um, he knows how to make a note and he'll tell you and hopefully he'll agree with me that um, taking a tasting note isn't necessarily about trying to transfer what you taste to someone else. I look at it as, as basically double prong. Number one, it's meant to give people an idea if they will like the wine and the style that it's in. And this is one reason why when I do uh, tasting notes, I'm very, I, I very rarely just make it just a list of of you know fruit salad you know blackberry blueberry strawberry of course i do say that cherry sometimes those references are important um for me the most important thing is if i love i love pinot noir with a strawberry character i love pinot noir that has a little rhubarb earthiness so if i see like strawberry and rhubarb in a tasting note i'm gonna probably actually chances are i will probably be more likely to buy that wine um especially if i know the winemaker and know the person who took the notes and keith jackson's in a hair Yes, got the got the Pliny. I, as I've said, there's something about Pliny that makes the show magic. So I'm I'm very stoked. Um, Eddie Eddie Gray, how many uh, how many guys who work for a distributor get furloughed and still go out and sell wine, dude? You're a monster. That's why we love you, buddy. Chicken enchiladas with a friend. Oh man, too bad, Lynette. I was really hoping you'd say uh, Smashberry Rosé, um, fried chicken that loves red, Pinot Noir, Gamay um sparkling wine you know i mean there's not a lot of macerated red sparkling wines that aren't sweet you know i i think that um brachetto is a very uh, very sweet uh, sparkling red wine that i say it's the best jacuzzi wine in the world uh it is literally so amazingly delicious and grand uh and corey's here and uh we see uh, glenn glenn's in the house drinking some ballard lane zin Excellent, because we're going to be talking about Ballard Lane Zen tonight. I've got a real big treat for you and something that I've actually never done. I actually went through my notes, my history books, and my own kind of experience in thinking about history and went through the major epochs of, uh, of wine history, starting uh, about 10,000 years ago. 
And we have evidence from almost 9,000 years ago of um, clay, uh, clay vessels holding wine uh, near Tbilisi, Georgia. So 10,000 years ago, we were putting wine in, in ceramic. Ceramic was really probably introduced somewhere between 7,500 uh, 7,500 BCE and probably about 5,500 BCE in most parts of Europe. Of course, the Chinese learned to fire pottery about 3,000 years before we did. So we have archaeological evidence from Zhahu, China from over 10,000 years ago, just about 10,000 years ago, that basically said, yes, they were making extreme beverages that included grapes. So uh, this, um, this beverage that's been sort of dubbed Chateau Jahu, uh, and it's actually made by the Dogfish Head Brewery. If you're so inclined to taste it, you can order it. You're basically going to be um, drinking uh, grape juice, hawthorn fruit, honey, uh, and uh, grapes, and uh, maybe a couple other ingredients uh, blended in for all of their disaccharide fermentable sugar. And then, of course, we uh, are able to taste this amazing beverage that's made today. Uh, as a recreation of the world's oldest archaeologically confirmed alcoholic beverage. Really cool. If you've never tasted Chateau Jahu, you should. Excellent. So what are we doing today? After the Zin, so we're gonna taste, we're gonna taste a Zinfandel that you can buy for another about two weeks at about $7.50 a bottle, which is the Ballard Lane Zin. Uh, it's a 91 point um, uh, tasting panel, maybe 92 points now that I think of it. Uh, beautiful Zinfandel, absolutely gorgeous. I, you know, John's drinking it. Hey, Brett and Beth are here, two of my colleagues from uh, college and, uh, and junior high school and high school. So it's always nice to have you guys here. Thank you guys so much for being here. So in about two minutes, we start the program. We're going to do the Zin, uh, Ballard Lane Zin, then we're going to do the Jay Wilk Zin. I'm going to revisit the 2014 Zin uh, after uh, a couple days uh, open. Uh, and I want to uh, actually uh, taste that wine after three or four days uh, open with the Repor. So uh, a lot of you guys were interested in this technology. Uh, they're about two bucks a piece, a little bit less if you buy a bunch of them. I give them as gifts constantly. And when you pull the, the little uh, piece of plastic or a little foil off here, um, like a little childproof thing, all of a sudden it activates. You can actually hear it. It will not spill in the wine if the wine's on the side, but you do want to keep the wine upright. It's totally safe. You can't hurt yourself with this, but it absorbs oxygen, which is absolutely fantastic. All right. And then, um, shoot, it is 459. So I recommend all of you, all of you should make sure you have something delicious in your glass. You're comfortable. You're in the right place. If there's kids in the room, I do not use four letter, four letter explicatives. If I can help them, I've let a few, uh, fly. Um, they will normally be under my breath. I do have a fairly extensive vocabulary beyond words that were considered a, a curse in the ancient world. So I am not going to curse any of you on purpose. So if there are little uh, kidlets, little grommets running around, um, well, they shouldn't be day drinking unless you really want them to be day drinking. I would say probably children day drinking isn't a great thing. But that being said, it is five o'clock. Welcome to Day Drinking with Wes Hagen. I am your host, Wes Hagen. I am the winemaker for Jay Wilkes Wines and the brand ambassador for the Miller Family Wine Company. And I'm feeling fantastic today. I've had a really, really good day. I had a great, long, really intense workout with my, uh, with my professional trainer yesterday, uh, who also happens to be my wife and the producer of the show. And she wrecked me. And there's something so great about working out really, really hard and then waking up the next day and knowing all you have to do is just let your body rest. So tomorrow I'll wake up and feel... It's funny because when I first started doing this exercise program, why am I doing an exercise program? Generally, because if people get out of prison ripped, I think we should probably get out of us, uh, uh, you know, being sequestered, being in sparkling isolation. And I've used that joke so many times, but I say sparkling isolation because it has to be in Courant, France for it to be a true quarantine. I have to look up what that reference is. There's gotta be a real Courant, France. And I bet there's something about it that has to do with the history of quarantine. My guess is some awful disease. Marcus Hansen's in the house. Dave Rominger's in the house. We've got Ari's in the house. We got Mark, we got Dom, we got them all. So let's go. One other thing is uh, during my presentation of these wines, I will not answer questions and I will generally try to avoid looking to see who's coming in. Sometimes it's very difficult because I am completely ADD, ADHD. So this is a little bit of sort of um, 
uh, attention deficit theater, and I hope you guys enjoy it. You guys get to watch me. You guys get watch me go crazy and talk about all this stuff. And then I'm so excited. Again, this is something I've never done before. This is a lecture I've never given. This is a list I've never created. This is something I'm incredibly excited about. In fact, I had meant to actually contain this entire idea in tonight's show, but we're not even supposed to be doing content Tuesday night. I'm supposed to give you two wines and get out of here. I can't stop myself. So what are we doing? Hi, Nikki. Uh, we are going to talk about the top 10 historical technological advances in wine. And as I started, it actually says top five and top five's crossed out. And then it was top 10, top 10's crossed out, top 10 with a number of honorable mentions. There's a lot of information here. Some of it we've talked a little bit about on the show and some of it we haven't even touched. So there's gonna be some really cool content tonight. And tonight we are going from Oh, about 3,500 to 4,000 years ago up to uh, up to basically, what, 1919, uh, Senator, Senator Volstead and the evil that he gave us and how Senator Volstead from Minnesota, I assume he's from Minneapolis, maybe he's from like Moose Lake or something, who knows, but uh, why Senator Volstead, the guy that, the only thing about Minnesota that I don't like is that the 19th Amendment prohibition was written by a senator named uh, Volstead from uh, Minnesota. Um, I'm going to back up. And as the last part, we're gonna end in 1990, or actually 1929. And I'm gonna explain why prohibition was absolutely vital for the ascendancy and the supremacy of 20th century California winemaking. So we're going from 4,000 BCE up to about 1929 to get to the first six pieces of the technology that I want to, I want to discuss today. So looking forward to that. That's going to be really fun. Uh, but right now let's go ahead and uh, uh, jump in uh, after I take a nice big sip of my Pliny. My blood sugar is just a tiny bit low. So this uh, being a, a pretty big um, kind of rich malty beer. Chock full of so many hops it could choke a horse. This is a hundred IBUs, which means this is the most bitter a beer can be, and this is as bitter as the human papillae and the bitterness receptors in my tongue can actually feel. If it had more uh, bitterness to it, more international bitterness units, IBUs, I wouldn't be able to taste them with a human palate. Um, so the question is, should women with higher taste bud density go to 120? I think they should. They deserve it. All right. I polished my glass today. So it is a brilliant, and if, if you want two quick little sommelier secrets, um, the cleanest glasses I've ever seen were in West LA when Peter Birmingham uh, was still sawning down there. And I walked into a Clopepi tasting that I was just showing up and all the stuff was already done. The wines were poured, the glasses were on the table, well, the glasses were on the table and the glasses were the cleanest glasses I've ever seen. So I had to ask him, how did you get those glasses so clean? And he said, denatured alcohol. And I was like, oh, man, is there anything that alcohol can't do? But honestly, if you take denatured alcohol and you clean the glass and you let it all evaporate and then you polish the glass, I've never seen cleaner glasses. Another big psalm trick is steam. So you just get basically a, uh, you know, an electric uh, tea kettle, which Americans don't really know too much. But if you've got a uh, if you've got a, a British grandmother. Yeah, you know, you know what a what a uh, electric tea kettle looks like. Get that tea kettle flowing, rocking, and just spitting steam, and then uh, the steam is, and then you steam the glass outside, inside, and then you polish it. So a steam polish or a denatured alcohol polish are be careful with denatured alcohol because it is poisonous. But if you want your glasses to shine, you'll never see anything quite so quite so awesome. Okay, so we are going to uh, also. Uh, exhibit just how easy and quicker it is to remove a Stelvin screw cap. Um, you may or may not see the Stelvin screw cap or the non-traditional closure appear in part two of the wine technology. So tonight's part one, uh, 3,500 BCE to 1929 and then 1929 all the way till today. All right. So remember when we open a screw cap bottle, this is uh, the 2017 uh, uh, Central Coast, um, Ballard Lane, uh, Zinfandel. Ballard Lane Zinfandel, uh, right now, Miller Family Wine Company with the DD50 uh, uh, code, $10 a case shipping, $7.50 a bottle. And it is really, really good Zin. It is for an everyday drinking wine, for a, for a quarantine wine, for a sip wine, 
you know, shelter in place, um, sustainability and practice. I'm sure there's a lot of different uh, uh, phrases that we could come up with. Um, hit the collar, pop that out. It definitely can use, this is a Venturi, but this is, makes a really cool sound. In fact, I'll put it up here so you guys can all hear it. And what this is going to do is aerate the wine. What are we doing? We're putting dissolved oxygen into the solution of the wine to carburate it, to make it more volatile. Uh, you can't smell wine. You can only smell what comes off the wine in a volatile way, just the same way gasoline doesn't explode, the volatility of gasoline explodes. So for the same reason, if you had glass uh, gasoline in a glass, you can imagine that if you swirled it around and put a flame to it, maybe the, the little poof of flame might be bigger than if you just carefully poured it in and, and put a flame to it. So we are increasing the volatility of the wine. And boy, did it get bubbly. Can't really see all the bubbles. And as we always do, we look at color. Now, again, remember, as I've said before, that the idea of color in wine has really become far less important than it was back in the days of the 50s and 60s when uh, the 20 point system first emerged from the University of California, Davis, uh, Amarine uh, and Winkler and all those wonderful people inventing interesting ways to uh, judge wine. Uh, originally, two points out of 20 were color. Um, most uh, modern judging takes color out, but the wine can be uh, judged down by a typical color, a, an incredibly light colored red or a weird colored white. Um, and certainly if it looks odd in its peer group in a, a flight of 10 wines, it may give you pause to stop and look. Every other wine is light, straw, brilliant, and one wine is golden and cloudy. Chances are that one wine in the middle may, may have a problem. Interestingly enough, there are two kinds of wines that are entered in wine competitions. Wines that by virtue of their quality that the winemaker and the marketing department think are going to win a gold medal or are going to win the show. Every winemaker, when they send the wines in, is expecting a gold medal because we wouldn't send the wines in if we didn't think they were great. Then there's the second kind of wines that are entered in the competition. And I can see Mark Zeidler smiling all the way down in West Los Angeles. I'm assuming he's probably still in Santa Monica. That you can't sell the wine. The wine sucks. No one buys it. It's, it's sitting on shelves. It has no accolades because no one's willing to give it a thing. And so the person thinks, okay, well, in that case, maybe that little piece of hair is just bugging me. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, so the winemaker thinks, okay, we're screwed. This wine sucks. We can't sell it. Let's just, let's just shotgun it to a hundred competitions and maybe we'll get a panel of really crappy wine judges and they will not know that this wine has issues. Um, normally those wines stick out like a sore thumb. Sometimes they're the wrong vintage. Sometimes they're cloudy. Sometimes they're microbial. Sometimes they smell like a mouse that's been like, you know, basically sitting behind a, a refrigerator for a week. I mean, there's, I I've actually had probably a hundred times in my career as a wine judge. Fortunately, I've never done this with my own wine. Goodness is, uh, to use the evil letters D N P I M. And when you put DNPIM, I was taught DNPIM by Heidi Peterson Barrett, who used to be the winemaker at, uh, at Screaming Eagle. Name dropper. Um, but yeah, she taught me to judge wine uh, way back in the, in the 90s uh, in the LA County Fair, home, or LA County Fair uh, International Wine Competition. And she said, you will hit wines that you will put your nose in and go, what the boop? was this winemaker thinking setting this wine to competition and in the situation where you think putting that wine in your mouth might not be safe or might not even be pleasurable why would you smell a wine and if it does not smell like something you want to put in your mouth why would you so she taught me dnpim which in your notes as a winemaker means did not put in mouth which means basically the wine smelled so foul so wrong so atypical that we decided not even to taste it so that is eliminated from the competition. Also, while I'm talking about wine competitions, before we start talking about this delicious Ballard Lane Zinfandel, welcome to day drinking ADHD theater with Wes Hagen. Uh, that in general, that when you are going through uh, all these wines as judging them, I always say that if you really take your time and you're a good wine judge, you walk out of a day of judging, maybe doing 80 to 120 wines, fly to wet, and when we first started this, 
it would be uh, whites in the morning, reds in the afternoon. You do all your whites and then you do all your reds. What we found out is that if you alternate white and red flights, you can go almost twice as long. And who doesn't want to go twice as long? So what we want to do is we want to do a white flight, red flight, white flight, red flight, pink flight, bubble flight, red flight. So we're basically cleansing our palate with the enzymes in white wine, getting all the red wine tannin out of our palate and not with roast beef or Graeber olives. Oh my gosh, if you never had a Graeber olive, you have to have a Graeber olive. Uh, so you basically are trying to clean your palate because if you do, you know, I've done like 72 Merlots in the afternoon and honestly, after 30, I'm done. My palate just feels like it's been whacked by a two by four. My brain feels like, you know, I haven't slept for a day and I just took the LSAT. Focusing on the aromatics and the quality of wine is one of the most, to me, one of the most cerebral things I can do. Um, I would put it on the same level of, of trying to read James Joyce's Ulysses without cliff notes or without, you know, criticism. It's it's gnarly. It, it's, it's crazy. And if the problem with me as a wine judge is I have this issue. And that is I judge every wine that's put in front of me, 100 wines a day, as if every single one were mine. And I want to get it to gold because gold doesn't mean perfect. Gold means delicious. Gold means you can share it with your friends. Gold means it's a wine worth sharing. And if four wine judges can agree on a gold medal for a wine in a competition, I strongly believe that that is a greater uh, in indication of quality than a 90 point score. Because one guy tasting the wine, incredibly famous wine critic that I talked to one time. Could be James Lauvey from the Wine Spectator, could be Robert Parker, could be Antonio Galani. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call anybody out, but I asked him at a tasting of Santa Rita Hills wines, 11 people were there besides me, so they can all say that this was true. One of the kingmaker critics, we were just kind of shooting the breeze, talking about uh, Santa Rita Hills and everything. And he said, well, you know, you guys have answered all my questions. Do you have any questions for me? I said, well, yeah, you know, I think it's one of the most compelling questions for me is, Okay, you got two days. One day, there's no traffic on the Golden Gate Bridge going to work. You had a fantastic evening before, delicious food. Uh, your, your wife was in a wonderful mood. Maybe you had just like an awesome time, uh, whatever. You are absolutely, all of your little, um, if you've ever played The Sims, you, you, you know, your, your happiness is from a red to a green. Everything's on green. You are just, you're happy, you're healthy. You're well taken care of and you are just stoked and you drive to the wine spectator office and you taste my wine. How would the point score change if you got in a really terrible accident and totaled your car, your wife and you were in a fight, your daughter just put some really kind of naughty pictures up on Facebook that you found about the night before and then you taste my wine. He said three points. He said his mood, his mood can, can shift to wine three points. He, he said not to really, I mean, he said it so honestly that he didn't, he didn't really make me like declare an NDA or anything, but um, that's why I'm being incredibly kind and not outing uh, this, this individual. But isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that, that uh, a, a kingmaker critic would, in, would admit that an 89 could be a 92 uh, depending on, on their mood? Ballard Lane Zinfandel, here we go. So Zinfandel, remember, is one of the only grapes that I like to use the term grapey, because Zinfandel is grapey. Uh, the term we use at, at UC Davis when I did some extension courses there really uh, was Venice. So Venice is the, is the idea that it smells like a grape. And uh, one thing about Zin, and I can, I can just smell these like crushed raspberries and, uh, and uh, nice sort of black grapey aromas and a little bit of baking spice. Hmm, a little bit of cherry, just but the, the raspberry and the grapiness in this really, really get me. Maybe a little bit of boysenberry. It reminds me a little of my uh, of my grandma Bertram's boysenberry jam, which people used to fight over uh, at the uh, at the uh, Lakewood Presbyterian um, uh, yearly. I don't know what it was, just a, everyone would make interesting stuff, craft fair. But um, my grandparents grew boysenberries in their backyard in Long Beach, and they had... 200 boysenberry plants. I mean, it was like their backyard was fairly spacious and it was basically just a boysenberry farm. And, uh, oh man, the pies and the, mm, and the turnovers and 
So boysenberry. So that's the thing, right? Aroma, when you get the right aroma, it takes us back. You know, if I smell pepper trees, you know, the sort of, um, uh, what is it, capsaicum californicum or whatever, the California red, uh, forget what the Latin name is, but when I smell that in conjunction with a little bit of like um, road tar, takes me back to uh, my elementary school in Long Beach, uh, Los Cerritos Elementary, which was uh, completely surrounded by those huge pepper trees. And of course, the warm temperature, the sunshine in Long Beach on that blacktop. So the blacktop and that pepper, sometimes if I get that in a Rhone a wine, sort of white red pepper and a little bit of road tar, I might be much more excited about those aromas because of the frame of reference. And it brings me back in a to a time and a place where I, I thoroughly enjoyed being there from what, fourth to sixth grade. Mm. Bright, fresh, primary. Really nice, really nice, um, really nice berry fruit. Um, deep sort of grapiness, a little bit of tannin, juicy. I, I would say if I had to give it one word, I would I would go with juicy. I believe both of these wines are eighty are ninety five percent Zinfandel and five percent Petit Syrah. Somehow I did lose, I did lose the other uh, connection. So people might be uh, jumping in on here. What else, what else about this Zinfandel? Um, so chances are, chances are um, the Ballard Lane has been sourced not only from the French Camp Vineyard, where we have been sourcing grapes since the uh, mid 80s when that when that vineyard first came online. Uh, French Camp Vineyard south of Shandon, east of Creston, in the southeast corner of all 12 of the slightly annoying Pal uh, uh, Paso Robles AVAs. So uh, it's really just in the very, very southeast corner up at elevation, but we're probably pulling uh, some grapes in from uh, Strella District and some other places. So we're probably getting some really, really good deals on Zinfandel wherever we can, blending them all together. Um, obviously, if it was 100% French camp, we probably couldn't um, make it like an eight or $9 glass pour, and certainly we couldn't sell it to you for less. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So uh, let's jump in. And do Zin number two. We're going to do three Zins tonight. We are overachieving tonight. And all right. Certainly, the more people watching you open a bottle of wine, the more likely it is that a natural cork will break. I didn't decant, but I probably should have. Wow, okay. So this wine is much more complex. It has tons, uh, uh, certainly um, a bigger fruit expression, darker, richer fruit expression. This one's like bright and raspberry. This one's sort of like dank and blackberry. It also has a the slightest, slightest hint of a little bit of mercaptan. And that Mercaptan means that the uh, the aging of this wine was uh, made in absence of a lot of oxygen. So we didn't bubble oxygen through it. We didn't play around with it. Um, what I suspect is this wine needs a decantation is that that slight, that slight tarry edge to it. I mean, it's all fruit and bright and pepper and white pepper and all these things. It's funny that I mentioned white pepper and, uh, and a little bit of, uh, of that sort of um, elegant, edge of perception road tar, because that's exactly what's happening. Um, you are not going to stick your nose in this and think, ooh, it smells like road tar. What I'm saying is it's like bramble berry, you know, kind of a blackberry, a little bit of cherry and grape, and then right on top of it is baking spice. It's already gone. So yes, yeah, so it's Mercaptan. So you actually, I'll teach you guys uh, how to tell the difference between Mercaptan and Dime Mercaptan. This is a winemaker trick that I learned. Uh, from Joey Tensley, I think, who, if you were watching yesterday, you remember, we started in Santa Barbara County Wine on the same day in 1996, uh, both getting the same uh, seller jobs at, uh, at Babcock. Um, but trick is you throw a penny in it. 
Now, most pennies don't have much copper in them. In fact, the copper content of most modern pennies is so, is so frail that this is probably not even going to work. But if you use a penny uh, from back uh, old enough, and remember, you throw a penny in wine. I don't care what's in the penny. Uh, you swirl it a few times. It's uh, the wine, the pH, the F, everything in the wine. It's going to make it safe. So don't worry about dirty pennies in the world of COVID. And if you do have dirty pennies, what? why are you touching dirty pennies? <laughs> So what I want to do is, if this wine was going to show a little bit of that, um, a little bit of that sort of uh, tarry funk, which I freaking love, big surprise. I mean, it is a wine I made. If I didn't like it, I probably would have got it out before we bottled it. What I would do is I just toss a penny in it, and I would and I would uh, aerate it. Now I just aerated it. I gave it some air, and basically all the Mercaptan blew off. Dye Mercaptan does not blow off. It smells more like onions, garlic, or um, like burnt rubber. And the problem is, is you have to hit it with ascorbic acid and uh, dissociate uh, the dimer captain into simple mercaptan and then hit the mercaptan with copper sulfate and then it's gone. So the reason why a penny works is the copper approximates basically the solution to create copper sulfate within the wine. Uh, there'll be some SO2, which gives you your sulfur, the copper from the wine, give it a swirl. It becomes, it becomes volatile, mercaptan blows off. And if you don't have a penny, just... Give yourself uh, a little bit of a uh, wrist exercise in a completely safe and non-profane way. And uh, boom, it's gone. Now it's just fruity and bright. There's an echo, right? I mean, that's the loveliest thing about wine is it always reminds us with an echo, you know, an echo of earth, an echo of salinity, an echo of minerality. Uh, and, and it's these echoes that really drive my imagination. And it's like the flavors that are at or on the edge of perception. Um, the greatest spices are always added at the edge of perception. Is that garlic? Is that salt? Is that truffles? Because if it's obviously, I mean, great example of truffles is a little bit of truffle is such an amazing flavor and it gives you that. But if you like buy their, I love Trader Joe's. The only thing I don't like at Trader Joe's is their Trader Joe's brand um, truffle potato chips because they are so intensely flavored with fake truffle oil that it's, it's, it's too much. It's too much, too much of a good thing. Um, which is possible. Remember, moderation in all things, including moderation. That's Oscar Wilde. He also said, um, brilliance borrows, genius steals. No, that wasn't Oscar Wilde. That was me. Screw that guy. He stole my stuff at all those beautiful London salons. A wonderful man. It's funny because I'm, you know, you search for ways to describe what you what you smell in a wine, but I always say that I don't want to just give you fruits. I want to give you stylistic. So I'm going to say this is a medium bodied uh, Zinfandel with a lot of very complex aromatics. It's a wine, even though it's 2016, it's been in bottle for about three and a half, about three years. I think this wine could easily go another five, six years. In fact, I don't think this is as uh, showing the same level of maturity as that beautiful, bright 16 Pinot Blanc that we tasted. I think that Pinot Blanc will hit full maturity before this. Of course, this wine has probably uh, the tiniest little bit uh, more alcohol than the 16 Pinot Blanc. They're both very, uh, very delicate and gentle. This one is, um, actually it's not, was it 16? No. Holy crap. I am so sorry. Some of you must have noticed that I opened another 2014 Zinfandel, which is a huge bummer because I think this was my last bottle. So I opened a 2014 Zin a while ago. So this will be a really good indication. Of how the repour has saved this wine after many days. So now I'm going to throw the exact same wine that was open. I have to look back in my notes, but this wine has been open for a little while. I'm going to throw some of this in the glass. Might have just been yesterday. How time flies in quarantine. And welcome to Courant, France. Strawberry. I did not get a lick of strawberry. So what we're seeing is an oxidation of a little bit of those bright uh, red and blackberry fruits. And as they um, slightly oxidize, they have not lost. They've produced no hydro or basically um, no ethyl acetate, no volatile acidity. The wine still smells super sound as a pound, but it is absolutely opened, uh, sort of broadened, has um, 
a lot more, a lot more uh, strawberry and slightly dried fruit character after 24 hours open. Now, a wine that's been in bottle for longer than five years, six years almost, um, is going to struggle to really, uh, you know, last overnight because it's already absorbed some oxygen. It's already basically begun to oxidize and start showing secondary and tertiary character. So I'm actually really, really stoked that this wine is still showing some nice, nice fruit. And you know how I feel about strawberries. Mm. And that is lovely. Uh, the finish is much more complex. I'm getting a little bit more uh, the acidity also is showing through sort of uh, there's not quite as much baby fat as there was um, uh, when I first opened the bottle. But because the baby fat has uh, sublimated, what's coming out of the wine is a level of sort of a kind of a granity minerality that was not there when I first opened it or in the bottle that I just opened. I've got two open bottles of 2014 Zinfandel and my, my wife is probably... Uh, struggling a little bit with a uh, minor migraine. So chances are she is not going to touch uh, the red wine with the brain fire going on. So I've got, I've got some homework. I've got a lot. I have to admit, I've probably got like 12 bottles of wine open right now. It's, it's, it is one of the uh, problems with this repour thing. I've got like 10 repours going right now and every one I've tasted in the last two weeks is still sound as a pound on my, on my front counter. So part of me feels that I owe it to all of you to follow through and make sure those wines are consumed. And part of me realizes that I also have to be a little bit more careful in the way that I, in the way that I, I consume alcohol. So I don't get out of, um, sparkling isolation with a with a serious drinking problem. Oh, thank you for the strawberry stuff. All right, so we tasted some wines. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go back, and for my friend uh, Mark McPhillips, I'm going to have a large sip of beer with you, my friend. Cheers. If you want to tell me where you are and what you're drinking, I always love to hear. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have a wine technology that you want me to describe, um, and what the hell do I mean by wine technology? Oh, you will find out. Also wanted to take just a second um, uh, of, of seriousness to um, mention the passing of Larry Sarlis. And um, Larry fell off his horse, um, helping some friends uh, on a ranch in Santa Barbara, uh, Hope Ranch, I believe. And um, he made a valiant effort to recover. Unfortunately, he didn't recover and he passed. I believe yesterday or, or the day before. Um, Larry is an important part of my life. Uh, he was one of my first uh, vineyard consultations. He bought an apple ranch at the very top of what would become the Ballard Canyon American Viticultural Area here in Santa Barbara. And um, he called me. He called me and said, this was before I wrote the Ballard Canyon American Viticultural Area petition. I heard you know some stuff about dirt. I heard you know some stuff about ag. I was hoping you would come up and look at our property and give us some advice. So I did a very early uh, consultation with and met Keith. Keith, um, Larry's father, I'm, I know he's dealing with a lot. I really need to reach out to him. Um, he's always been an incredibly kind and supportive friend to me. He also introduced me to basically the heroine of the internet, which is Reddit. So damn you, Larry, you know, you know, excuse me, damn you, Keith, uh, for that. But um, Definitely, uh, Larry. Um, thank you. And and then not only did he give me one of my first vineyard consultations, but Larry, when I left Clopepe, heard the rumor that I was taking it pretty hard, which I did, and uh, invited me to uh, lunch and bought me lunch. And after a bottle of wine, I kind of thought maybe they were going to ask me, give me a job. But they did something even better, which is basically break down what they thought my greatest assets were in the wine business and maybe where I should point those assets. And even though um, I would have been stoked to go to work for the Sarlos family because I had great, great love for the Sarlos family uh, and uh, everybody in it, um, in the end, um, you know, I went on and became the, the winemaker here at Jay Wilkes. So just want to let you guys know that. Uh, that uh, that Larry has missed and we've lost two people in Santa Barbara County wine in a very difficult time. And the fact that I can't um, commiserate with his family and um, participate likely in his 
Um, hopefully there'll be some opportunity for us to speak maybe remotely so I can talk about my relationship with Larry. And he was like as close to a real cowboy as anyone I'd ever known. So I won't, I won't linger on it, but um, I do want to uh, raise a glass of delicious um, Paso Robles. I wish, I wish it was Syrah from Ballard, uh, Ballard Canyon. Uh, but here's, here's to uh, Larry Sarlos and Keith. Love you, baby. I'm going to reach out to you as soon as I can miss you. And I'm so sorry. I know how important family can be. So every breath is a miracle. Remember the law, Wes's law of emotional equilibrium. When you lose someone in your life, whether it's a dog, a cat, a mom, a dad, a husband, a wife, a kid, take the love you had for that person and twist it and throw it back into the world. You are now open to take the love you had for that person and redirect it. So I, I promise, Larry, I promise, Keith, that I will do everything I possibly can to take the love I had for that wonderful man and make this world better. Um, promote flourishing, promote love, promote everything that you were guys, guys were doing. Fun wines, delicious wines. Let's all drink a Sarlos and Sons wine soon. So cheers, cheers. All right, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna take just a moment and welcome everybody that's come in since I have been babbling on about so many different things. Uh, Marianne, thank you for being here, appreciate it. And Jim, Jim, so good to see you. Hope you're uh, enjoying that 17 Ballard Lanes in. And we got Christopher Von Holt, welcome my friend. Uh, Captain Fatty's Calypso, Crystal Labonte, Captain Fatty's, if you don't know it, they're making some great wines and or great beers in Santa Barbara. Um, one of my buddies, Jason Osborne, did some consulting uh, beer making there, and he is a freaking genius. If you haven't had Captain Fatty, so I met a guy at a wine dinner at for a Jay Wilkes dinner, and we were talking about beer, and he's like, what local beers do you like? Totally putting me on the spot, right? I'm like, really like Firestone Walker, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm really liking Figaro Mountain, you know, um, M Special is pretty good, um, but I also have a friend who's actually making some beer at a place called Captain Fatty's, and I think uh, some of their beers are some of the best I've had in Santa Barbara County, which is actually saying something because we make good beers here. He's like, I'm fatty, and this dude was lean. I mean, this guy was like a little, a little healthier probably than I was at the time, and I'm like, dude, so was it a college name for your, you know, love of, you know, uh, currently legal uh, sort of highly regulated uh, vegetables in the state of California? Um, dude, you're not, he's like, when I was a kid, I was huge. And everyone called me fatty. My family's name for me was fatty. And as a result, I got lean, I got skinny, I got healthy. And now it's sort of a joke. So. There was a there was a sailor, a captain, and then there was Fatty, who is anything but Fatty, but Captain Fatty's good stuff. So I hope you're enjoying your Captain Fatty's Calypso. That sounds wonderful. Ballard Lane's in. Kelly uh, Kelly Wilkes is drinking some uh, Ballard Lane's in. Welcome Kelly. If you don't know Kelly, she's uh, Jeff Wilkes, the original wine maker at Jay Wilkes, um, his sister. And uh, I consider her a friend as well. We've spent some wonderful time. Also, I don't know if Michelle Shin is on, but I got the book today. Uh, she sent me, check this out. I do, I do not do this show for gifts, but since I've been doing it, I've been receiving cool stuff, which is making me think that this media thing is pretty damn cool. So this is the original Wine Folly book, Madeline Puckett, uh, and uh, changed my life as a wine educator. Are you ready? She recognized when she ordered this book, there's a new one. Whoops. That's the problem. Oh. <laughs> I, I swear I haven't been day drinking. So this is the new Wine Folly book with the 2019 James Beard Award winning uh, sticker on it. And it's got a lot of new stuff in it. And I can't wait to have the time to spray it with alcohol uh, to you know basically make sure that uh, – I, I am not giving myself uh, any type of disease by reading this book. It's a wonderful book. If you do not know this book, it is absolutely fantastic. Totally good stuff. All right. So we've got someone talking a little bit about the flavor of black licorice. And Sandy Hightower, my, my Greyhound connection. Sandy Hightower um, 
basically helped us adopt some of our greyhounds. And if you've never had an uh, X racing greyhound in your life, you are missing out. They run 45 miles an hour. They stop traffic. They make you look like you're in the middle of an art deco painting. Everyone who sees you think you're a freaking hero because you saved that dog from vivisection or being turned into dog food. And in the end, they are one of the greatest pet animals in the history of the world. What does an X racing greyhound do for you? Well, first of all, they sleep over 20 hours a day. If you want a low impact, low stress animal in your life, greyhounds, all they want to do is a couple hours a day, they're going to follow you around the house, look at you cute. You're going to pet them once and they're going to go back to sleep. Take them to the dog park once a week. Let them like run like a crazy, crazy freak into their zoomies. Get their zoomies out. Zoomies maybe twice a week, at most three times a week. They are 45 mile per hour couch potatoes. They don't shed, they don't bark, they don't smell. And once you get one, there's a, a name for greyhounds in the greyhound adoption community, and that name is a chip. Why do they call them a chip? For the same damn reason as that great old Lay's commercial. You can't just eat one. Once you get a chip, you get another chip. And once you get a, a kind of a pack of greyhounds, one greyhound's about as easy as two greyhounds, and two greyhounds is about as easy as three greyhounds, and four greyhounds are about as easy because they all eat together, they all sleep together, they all move together. They move like a flock of birds. They move like a, a, a school of fish. Greyhounds are amazing. We used to have amazing greyhound rescue events over at Clopepe. One of my favorite uh, was we had a greyhound. One thing about greyhounds that isn't, sometimes when they come off a track, they're not smart dogs. Their brains were made for speed not trigonometry. So they are very um, aerodynamic. And as a result, they are so sweetly stupid. Why do we have problems with dogs? We have problems with dogs because they're smart. I had a border collie for 14 years. That dog basically was looking basically to take my job for 14 years. It was just looking at me like, I'm smarter than you. You know, you know, Rosa was an amazing dog. She's an absolute, absolute treasure. In fact, I've only done this once before, but yeah, that's Rosa when she was 12 weeks old. Kind of the best and the worst dog I ever had. Border Collies, huge pain in the butt, too smart. They'll get themselves into trouble. Jumped up one time and hung herself on, a, um, on the, the wires in the vineyard. And we heard something actually it was Mark McPhillips who's on right now. And his wife were like, do you hear that? And we ran around and found Rosa basically hanging upside down with her back legs wrapped in wire and saved her because of someone who's on this, uh, on this uh, um, Facebook live right now. So thank you so much. Okay. We're going to reset. So Shelby, I hope you're still here. Thank you so much for being here. If you don't know Shelby Sim, he's probably one of the greatest advocates for and uh, for just about uh, anything wine related, um, visit Santa, uh, visit San Inez, visit Santa Barbara. Absolutely. Oh, and Captain Fatty's has pickup available. Really good beer, cucumber sour, huh? And um, Jason Osborne, I don't know if he's still the consulting brewer there, but one reason I think Captain Fatty's is doing such a good job is him himself. Uh, Chef Scott Peterson Valenti is in the house. Thank you so much. Uh, Mary Ann, I'm glad you're here and Jim. Lovely to have you here as well. And let me go through real quick. We've got uh, some uh, Jolie Elman, one of my favorite people in the world, drinking some Verdad uh, Albarino, Sawyer Linquist Vineyard. And I'm going to move up just a little bit. Ryan, yes, that is exactly what it is. It is a Pliny. And what I've just found, it is kind of warm in the house today. It's about 73 in the house. It's about 75 outside of the house. It got up to about 81 today. I don't want to be drinking this Pliny. Oh my gosh, yes I do. But I have to because this is day drinking and this is part of my job. The day that the lockdown went into effect, I asked myself as a traveling ambassador of wine, I am completely useless as an employee until I have to make wine again. So how do I reinvent myself? So my boss looks at the company and says, well, if we have absolutely essential employees, Wes Hagen is one of them. So I invented this idea of day drinking in the Facebook Live that moment. And now um, 
I'm forced at five o'clock to get on with all you awesome people and spend a little time having a cocktail, having a beer, having a glass of wine, and really understanding that we're all in this together and we're going to get through it. I really believe so. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Cool. Why is it when I drink only once a wine I get sleepy? Wine is an amazing, I, I totally agree that wine is not a good working buzz. It's one reason why uh, winemakers drink so much beer in September and October in the, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere is because uh, drinking beer as we make wine is a great way to keep us relaxed. Making wine, I mean, think about like when you're making a wine, you're basically setting yourself up for the next three years, right? Year to grow it, year to make it, year to sell it. So you're putting three years of your life in every wine that you make. And if you stick your nose in that wine, it doesn't smell right. You've wasted three years of your damn life. So we really need to make sure that we make good decisions, but we make them in a relaxed fashion. You can tell a young winemaker and a, and a, and a seasoned veteran winemaker, the young winemaker will pull the trigger on harvest with the slightest provocation of weather. Ooh, here comes 90 degrees, pick it. Woo, here comes a quarter inch of rain, pick it. And then you look at, you know, people like Chris Curran, Bruno D'Alfonso, they're like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to New Mexico. We're going to go, we're going to go to the Santa Fe wine and wine and chili festival in late September, because we're just going to let it hang. Obviously they don't really have problems making quality wine. So you will recognize that some young winemakers have an intensity and a nervousness that can negatively impact the way that they make wine. And that's why old veteran winemakers make the best wine. Your Ken Browns, your Adam Tolmax, you know, uh, you know, geez, I mean, so many um, amazing, you know, I mean, the Martinelli family, you know, basically all of these, uh, all these wonderful families that, that do this stuff. All right. Well, I think we're caught up. Red sauce, Merlot, Zin, or Tempranillo would be, oh yeah. See, Jolie's doing my job. She's out there basically teaching. What do I mean by baby fat? Okay. Um, when I drink a young wine, what I get is a richness and a fruit extract within the wine. If you drink a young Pinot or a young Cab, everything that's like fruity and dense and, and, and that tastes like extract in your mouth, that 10 years from now would be completely gone in the wine. That's what I call baby fat in a wine. And so like when you drink a young Santa Maria Pinot Noir, it's very juicy, it's very fruity, it's very bright and primary. And then five years, it starts losing its primary character. And as the, the, the prop, baby fat is beautiful and problematic. It's beautiful because it gives us a, a delicious character to the wine. It really does. And a lot of people thrive. If you drink, I mean, if, if Mayomi is your thing, that's baby fat. If you've never had a Mayomi Pinot Noir, never had a glass of Mayomi, you've never had a glass of Rombauer Chardonnay, it's a combination of a little residual sugar a lot of ripeness and a lot of alcohol, glycerin, and glycerol. Uh, there are parts of, of alcohol that also give us a richness and an unctuousness in the wine. On top of the fruit and on top of the ripeness, that's baby fat. So what I, why I say baby fat is because the same way when a human loses their baby fat, their mature faces emerge. If you look at a, a, a picture of someone in their first birthday blowing out their candle or make a mess of their cake and say, what is that person going to look like when they're 18? What are they going to look like when they're 35? What are they going to look like when they're 55? It's tough. How do we imagine what the modern or the mature face of a human being looks like after the baby fat falls off their face? It's difficult. Wine is the same way. Baby fat in an American wine culture is what drives wine to sell and what gives Robert Parker the impetus to give a wine a high score. Because you look at Robert Parker's scores over 95, you'll see terms like dripping glycerin, so much extract. It was so chewy, the, the flavor lasted in my mouth for 30 seconds. A wine that would certainly beat anything on a plate in general. To me, baby fat is a good thing and a bad thing. Baby fat should be in balance in a young wine. And when the baby fat begins to sublimate, and kind of fall off in a wine, what happens is the complexity emerges. So the baby fat is covering up all the delicate and elegant aromas and flavors in a wine. And when you are, when you do something completely un-American, like show patience and lay down wine for five to 10 years, so 
you're basically the baby fat's falling off and the complexity is emerging. So if this is baby fat and this is complexity, where do you want to drink the wine? Do you want to drink the wine here where there's a little more baby fat than complexity? Or do you want to let the baby fat sublimate and taste wine that has much more complexity? Or do you want to wait until the fruit really dies and you have almost no fruit and all the complexity? I love all wines. I think everything has a, a voice and everything has an ability to show that. All right. If we don't get to uh, the first six wine technologies, we're not going to do it. Day drink in. I'm so stoked you guys are here. Otherwise, I would uh, I wouldn't have a job and I wouldn't have a a reason to to uh, drink um, five nights a week at five o'clock. Weekends? Am I drinking at five o'clock? Chances are I am, but I'm probably cooking while I'm drinking because I'm really enjoying cooking. I watched uh, a a show last night uh, that was produced uh, by Arnold Schwarzenegger and a couple other people, Carl Lewis and a lot of other people about a plant-based diet. I won't go into it too much, but it was such a good show. I think it was on either Netflix or Hulu um, that I'm actually considering giving up meat as I continue to work out because of the research and influence of what's happening in the world. The, the only problem is I cannot imagine that I would never be able to drink a Pinot Noir with duck confit. So I think what I'm going to do is look at uh, meat a little bit more like um, a treat. And then I'm going to try to go plant-based again. I don't know if I am, but it appears that for athletic and for bodybuilding, clearly and absolutely that a plant-based diet is the way to go. So I don't know how that's going to work, but stay tuned and you'll find out. Let's talk about wine technology. So where did wine start and really what is the beginning of wine technology in the world? Well, I'm going to give you guys a quick and dirty summation of my top uh, these are chronologically ordered. This is not the greatest invention in the world. Is no, not number one. Uh, number one is the earliest in in uh, history, and exactly how uh, how this affected wine historically. So I'm going to go ahead and start with number one, and uh, the number uh, the first great top ten wine technology was sulfur dioxide. You probably don't know. In the ancient world, it was very common. Instead of cleaning your house and, and cleaning the walls and cleaning the tables, it was very common to use a, a cauldron uh, and get a, a bunch of a good fire going and some good coals going, and then taking a bunch of elemental sulfur and laying it on the coals in the middle of the hearth in your house and getting the F out. And that would basically sterilize your entire household by virtue of sulfur smoke. So the first idea of cleaning a household, of, of bug bombing a household, to get the rats dead, to get the cockroaches dead, the ants dead, to sterilize your entire house was basically the ancient world burning sulfur. Did they know they were creating sulfur dioxide? No, they had no clue. But that's what, what happened. As a result, uh, the ancient uh, Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites found out that if you took sulfur and many times the vessels in which wine was transported by the Canaanites and the Phoenicians around the entire ancient world in the Mediterranean, they would, sometimes they would break the uh, amphorae. And remember, amphorae are jars that were used to transport wine. Cavevri were the vessels that were used to ferment wine. So wine has never really been fermented in amphorae, and a lot of people think it has. It's not true. So amphorae was about uh, the transport. And the coolest thing about amphorae, one of my things, is that the handles were branded. The way that the handles and maybe an animal or a symbol that was attached to the handles where one man would handle a cavevri and move, or excuse me, amphorae and move it, onto a boat and stack, right? That's really why, uh, you know, that uh, or, uh, amphorae were so popular. Now, if you didn't have enough money or clay or enough, um, enough potters to continue to make uh, amphorae, you would reuse them. And the way that they would be reused is after the wine had been emptied from the amphorae at its point of sale, you would basically rinse it and then wait for it to completely dry. Because what they found is if, if it was still wet, 
when you actually refilled it with wine, the wine would sometimes basically go bad uh, because of microbial issues. Now, some brilliant person thought about, well, hell, when my house is dirty, when I got bugs in my house, when I got stuff going wrong in my house, I just burn sulfur. So someone probably in Egypt uh, could be Rome. There's a lot of sort of disagreement on this. I'll go with Dr. Patrick McGovern, who's going to probably say Egypt, that they would turn the uh, amphorae over and they would burn elemental sulfur into the amphorae. And that would basically sterilize and desiccate. In other words, dry out. It would dry out and basically destroy all microbial problems within the amphorae and and then they would flip it fill it with wine and when they arrived what they found is the wine would sell sometimes for twice as much as wine that was not or amphorae that were not treated with sulfur why because what they were doing was putting active sulfur on the contact of 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 the of the clay of the ceramic so when they put wine in that the, uh, the sulfur would actually go into an active form of sulfur dioxide and keep the wine from oxidizing. And at that point, back in the ancient world, they would fill the, uh, fill the amphorae and then they could either put a, a stopper in it that would push a little wine out. So it was absolutely 100% filled and then they would uh, maybe burn some wax. Uh, another idea was olive oil. So you would pour olive oil on the top of the amphorae so to, to make a barrier of oxidation and then put the cork in and displace a little bit of olive oil. Both were common. But I'm going to go ahead and say sulfur dioxide and the use of sulfur dioxide to desiccate and to clean um, amphorae in the ancient world was the first most important technology that we developed. Number two, the clay vessel itself, the cavevery. Now, the cavevery is very important. This is a term that's used mostly in Georgia, Armenia, and other areas of Transcaucasia. And the cavevery is a large clay vessel that is uh, a kind of a conical shape. Why is it a conical shape? So we can dig a big damn hole in the earth, lay that cavevery 95% or 100% under the earth, dig it into the dirt. So basically you have a underground fermentation vessel fill it with macerated red juice or white juice or to make orange wine, whatever you put in that cavevery, you hit it with a little bit of yeast. In the ancient world, they would normally throw a fig into the wine vessel as is clearly indicated by Egyptian winemaking and basically every uh, Egyptian winemaking vessel, including a fig. Why the fig? Figs always have yeast on them. And they found that Eventually, they thought maybe throwing a fig in gave it a little sugar, but what ended up happening is almost every fig has plenty of Saccharomyces cerevisiae within the fig, and it begins the, uh, begins the fermentation. So in the end, the cavevery was put under the ground. Why do I think that is such an important technology? Temperature control. Suddenly, we have absolute temperature control in the way that we ferment wine. The cooler that the fermentation happens, the more delicate the fermentation aromas become. If you put a bunch of juice in a small, in a vessel, and it gets really bloody hot, you're going to blow off a lot of the beauty of the wine. So putting a cavevery in the earth and basically fermenting, allowing the coolness of the deep earth to cool the fermentation, basically gave us fermentation control thousands and thousands of years ago. That's number two. Number three cedar boats of lebanon lebanon grows some damn big cedar trees look up uh look up the uh the flag of lebanon what are you going to see it looks like stanford probably the greatest one of the greatest non-wine universities for winemakers robert mondavi don't even get me started lots and lots of amazing winemakers went to stanford but it has that huge you know stanford is a, is a redwood but Lebanon is all about cedar. And those beautiful Lebanese cedar trees produced the greatest boats in the ancient world. Those boats were used by the Phoenicians and uh, the Canaanites to move wine growing, wine culture, and wine itself uh, as a trade good throughout the ancient world through the Mediterranean. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, as weird as it sounds, that uh, Lebanese cedar boats uh, produced by the Canaanites and then the Phoenicians represent uh, an incredibly important part of wine technology because it brought wine to Egypt. It brought wine to Crete. It brought wine to Peloponnesia. It brought wine to Asia Minor. It brought wine to Greece. 
uh, and uh, Italy. So it's, it's incredibly important. Number four, we're going up to the first century of the Common Era. We don't really use BC and AD anymore. We use uh, BC and CE for uh, before the Common Era and the Common Era, which is a lovely uh, a gift to our, our beautiful Christian friends in a sort of post-Enlightenment world. Uh, we don't think it makes a lot of sense to talk about splitting the world uh, you know, of the Common Era. It's, it's, it's obviously important, but within the first century of the Common Era, Julius Caesar was taking care of Rome, and uh, he loved to trade with the Gauls because the Gauls always had goods for him. So the Gauls would bring down all these goods, trade for wine, but the Gauls weren't big fans of, of ceramic. They would take all the amphorae, they would empty the amphorae into hogsheads, into oak barrels. So they knew how to uh, burn and bend oak barrels 2,000 freaking years ago. They did an amazing job doing this. And as a result, they invented the modern oak wine barrel over 2,000 years ago. Oak wine barrel, we're still using it. Hey, Gauls, I'm pretty impressed. Uh, the French were amazing uh, technologists, even though they were trading for wine, but what they really wanted was lumber and honey. Um, all right, number five, Lewin, Hook, and Pasteur, the compound microscope. So you've heard me tell the story. Uh, Johannes Gutenberg in 1455 invented the movable printing press because he was a metal worker who knew how to make mirrors. He made a lot of mirrors uh, and, uh, and religious uh, stuff for uh, folks that were visiting famous religious sites. So he was a metal worker. Uh, he took his, the anecdotal story, he took his brother's wine press and turned it into the first printing press. Printing press gave us basically the middle class could afford books. When the middle class could afford books, all of a sudden they were using, trying to read these books and recognizing that their glasses were, or their eyes were terrible. As a result, lens technology, lens technology, lens technology. The printing press leads to literacy. Literacy le need, leads to the idea that we need glasses. Glasses gives us lens technology and lens technology lends uh, into Zealand, into the Netherlands and basically into the 16th and 17th century where lens technology took off in the Netherlands, especially in Zealand, and in a, a village called uh, Middleburg, uh, which is the capital of Zealand, uh, the Middleburgians basically invented the uh, prototype for the microscope and the telescope within 10 years of each other. And as a result, the microscope went to Leeuwenhoek, the telescope went to Galileo, and both of them absolutely changed the world. So poetically, wine is responsible for all cosmology and microscopy, which I think is absolutely cool as hell. In fact, I'd say that that deserves a sip of plenty. So basically, as a result, we've got the microscope, which Louis Pasteur, a couple hundred years after Leeuwenhoek and, um, and the whole Gutenberg thing, looked through the compound microscope and saw why fermentation actually occurs in reality and in science. Pre-Pasteur, 1855, the belief that wine was a divine gift. It was a gift from God to make us happy. If you want to believe that, you and Benjamin Franklin, that's awesome. That's fantastic. But if we want to know the actual science of wine, if we want to know the actual science of beer, what book did Pasteur write? Uh, Fermentation, the diseases of beer and how to prevent them. That was his first book after seeing the kinetics of fermentation under Leeuwenhoek's compound microscope. The compound microscope was created by lens technology, which was created by the printing press, which was created by a wine press. So clearly there is a line of understanding between wine technology, uh, lens technology and the compound microscope and Pasteur understanding the kinetics of fermentation and all the people that came before and after him looking at microscope talking about fermenta fermentation. When we understand fermentation from a, um, from a biological and physical perspective, suddenly we can move along and understand it from a scientific perspective. Compound microscope number five. The last one, you might be surprised, prohibition. Prohibition gave the United States the leg up on wine technology of any culture in, in the world. And I can prove it and back it up and I can debate it. Here's how it happened. We 
basically made uh, wine and beer illegal by mistake. The Anti-Saloon League and the Women Christians Temperance Union, and if you haven't seen Ken Burns' Prohibition, dude, get it on your list. Watch Ken Burns' Prohibition, and you will be blown away how alcohol changed this country, basically uh, challenged this country, how drunk we were as both, uh, I mean, um, in the uh, revolutionary and, uh, and in the early uh, life as Americans, um, revolutionary American men were basically broken into one bottle, two bottle, or a three bottle man. Were you a one bottle, two? Thomas Jefferson was a one bottle man. He was one of the few founding fathers that didn't drink whiskey, even though he probably produced it. He basically was one of the soberest men of his day. And he drank between two and three bottles of wine a day. Um, he was a one bottle man, which meant he drank a pint of whiskey a day, 16 shots, 16 shots of whiskey a day was a moderate or kind of, kind of a weak drinker back in the, back in this revolutionary era, two bottle, uh, a two bottle man was a moderate drinker or, a, a, you know, getting to the point of, of a heavy drinker, that's 32 shots a day. And basically, so what, 48 shots a day makes a three bottle man. A good example of a three bottle man is Ethan Allen, who didn't make furniture. He was a freaking drunk is who he was. In fact, Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys going back after a, uh, to the Carolinas after a fairly successful battle in the Revolutionary War was bit by a Snake while he was drunk and asleep on a cart being carried back by the Green Mountain Boy. And the anecdote is the rattlesnake died. That's how intoxicated he was. Those fangs sunk in, the hematoxin was injected, and the snake said, holy crap, this guy has such an immense amount of ethanol in his bloodstream, I'm done. So anecdotal, but, but pretty damn funny anyways. So prohibition. So prohibition in 1919, uh, Senator Volstead from Minnesota, basically the idea was, is the Anti-Saloon League was like, help us with whiskey, help us with drunkenness, help women and children that are being beaten by awful, mean, drunk men. This was a serious problem. That's one thing that a lot of people don't understand about prohibition. Like, oh, prohibition, what a bad idea. If you were a woman in the early 20th century, dealing with an alcoholic husband who would go to the saloons and come back completely screwed up on whiskey and that he had a bad, you know, obviously, I believe strongly, violent people who consume alcohol are violent, kind people who drink a lot of alcohol just become kind of weepy and, and kind of like sad, but they're pretty sad. I think alcohol exacerbates. Alcohol is a prism. It only reflects the light we put into it. So if you put kindness into it, it comes out, you're pretty good. But if you're a, if you're a jerk, I almost said the D word. If you're a jerk and you drink a lot, you become jerkier. If you're a mensch, you drink, you become menschier. I believe this. It's a, it's a prism to exacerbate and to intensify our actual personality. So people say, oh, I, I can't, I can't drink. You know, it, 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 it makes me mean. Bull, bull. No, 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 you're just a mean person. They're really good at hiding it until you're drunk. It's personally how I feel. Now, prohibition. <laughs> so when prohibition came in, basically all winemaking except for religious and uh, Eucharist uh, purposes stopped. So we stopped making wine in the United States in general. So the interesting thing is we lost a generation of winemaking, even in 10 years between 1919 and 1929, when we had the 21st Amendment, which basically allowed alcohol to be produced again. Wine and beer were not actually supposed to be included in Prohibition. The reason why wine and beer ended up being included in Prohibition is because those damn Germans in World War I, that all the famous breweries, Miller, Schlitz, um, Budweiser, Basically, all the family made a lot of lager beer in the United States and expensive or uh, popular lager beer were Germans. So in 1919, we weren't really fond of Germans in the United States. And as a result, there was a movement within the WCU and, and as well as the Anti-Saloon League to include beer and wine. The original idea is just liquor. Let people drink beer and wine. That'll be okay. Cool. Everything's fine. In the end, though, because of World War I and the impending and looming threat of, 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 of the Germans, 
um, and Kaiser Wilhelm, we basically included wine and beer in prohibition and probably shouldn't have. If only liquor would have been included in prohibition, we may still have a prohibition against liquor in this country. But when you tell people they can't have beer and you tell Italians they can't have wine, we freak the F out and we cannot handle that. So as a result, uh, home winemaking became extremely important in the Italian uh, communities within the United States. And uh, that became uh, sort of a, a side effect. And then, and like you know, you have like, basically grape concentrate being sold at Walgreens. And Walgreens actually became an, a really important um, pharmacy in the United States as a result of their success of selling a lot of interesting things during uh, prohibition, including wine. If uh, a lot of people actually converted to Judaism <laughs> during, uh, during prohibition uh, to be able to have access uh, to uh, sacramental and religious wine. Interesting stuff. And they would sell grape concentrate that would say, do not add water and leave in the sun, will ferment into devil alcohol. Oh, wow, okay. Pop the water, make some wine, have some fun. Um, why is prohibition critical to the development of technology of wine? It's because even though it was only 10 years, we lost everything. We forgot how to make wine. When you like, damn, I mean, I go to the winery in September and I'm like, okay, okay. Let me look at my notes from last year. How do I make wine? 10 months out of the year, you don't make wine. Then two months you do. It's like Santa Claus. Like, how do I, you know, how does Blitzen and, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, um, Rudolph fly? I, I haven't flown with these guys in, in a year. So you only get a couple of months to even make wine. So it's sometimes you kind of like have to go back to your notes, right? I think it's really actually interesting that way. And as a result, we had 10 years where we didn't make wine. So California winemaking pushed the reset button. France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Portugal, Austria, Greece, the Transcaucasia, the Asia Minor, all the places that have make, been making wine forever continued to make wine exactly how they did. We actually forgot how to make wine in California. We forgot how to make wine in the United States. So what did we do? We did not go back to anecdote. We went back to science. We had University of California at Davis. We had Cal State Fresno. We had Cornell. We had the University of Minnesota to say, now we're back into making wine. We are going to focus on the science, developing new varieties, doing everything we can to get in the field and help America and the United States push forward the idea of how to make wine correctly, cleanly, and with science-based understanding and not the anecdotal ninth generation. Well, this is just how we make a wine, you know? So America went from, and here's the problem. We focus so much on the science that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, a lot of people said, well, UC Davis is teaching people how to make sterile wine, wine that's not alive, wine that doesn't represent its place, wine that's so damn clean it just smells like fruit. We still hear this in the world of wine, right? No. It's all about what we learned in this period where wine died in the United States. And in its resurrection, in its moment, we reinvented it. And now more I would say, because I see this all the time, I don't really see when I was a really young winemaker in the, in the 90s and the late 80s, I saw a lot of wine, winemakers from California going to Italy and France and Portugal to learn a little bit more about how Europe makes wine. Now I don't see that. What I see is Chablisian winemakers, Burgundian winemakers, Bordeaux winemakers, Rhone winemakers, Greek winemakers, not only coming to the United States, but I probably get seven emails a year from the Chinese government saying, hey, Hey, bro, you want to come to China and make some wine? Because we'll pay and um, you can go on a quest for what, you know, General Zhao's chicken is. You can, you can eat a lot of delicious things. You can check out all these beautiful old sites in China. We will pay you to come to China, make wine, teach us some stuff, and we'll give you a pat on the back at the end, a couple thousand bucks and send you home. So Prohibition has reset the... New World Wine Clock, and given us UC Davis, Cal State Fresno, Cornell, University of Minnesota, and all the other amazing areas that teach us how to make wine. 
<sighs> I hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of that wonderful uh, idea of technology. I certainly uh, have a, a bit of a dry throat. I have no interest in drinking. I just need to wet my whistle. Something about Pliny the Elder gets me fired up. Let's look at what you guys have been talking about. Yep. Uh, my, Mark McPhillips, I do still have that scope that you gave me. And it's still on my uh, little Marlin 22, the first firearm I've ever owned. I don't look like a gun collector. It sort of found me. My wife's grandfather gave us a living will of 22 firearms while we were still living on Clopepe. And so as a result of me doing bird control, varmint control, and everything else I told him I wanted at the time, I was a little more of a carnivore, interested in going out and maybe shooting a couple pigs so I could eat my own meat. I've yet to shoot anything over a pound. I don't think I've ever shot and killed an animal over a pound, which basically means I'm, I'm, a, I'm basically dangerous to varmint. Uh, that's not true. I've shot and eaten a couple rabbits that were at least three or four pounds, maybe even more, five or six. So, yes, I still have that scope, and I'm stoked to have it. James Sparks, what's up, Liquid Farm? Love to have you in the house, JD, and jo John, and Jim. Thought out some frozen berries. Get it on. Marla's in the house, and Steve Edelman. Love to see you uh, down in Palos Verde, Steve. Give your best to my wife. Anthony and Bob, we got a couple Bobs in the house, and Zach and Jim. Thank you, Jim. That's a very kind comment. Hard, hard to. Uh, I mean, or at Jay Wilkes, uh, Julie, who you probably know, um, her father passed from COVID nineteen two weeks ago. So she is my, uh, as far as a close like friend and familial relationship. Um, I can actually say that I, I know someone who lost uh, a very important family member to this disease. So this virus. All right. Taking a quick look around, drinking some Smashberry Rosé. Jennifer, you are a wise, wise woman because I would say that Smashberry Rosé it's currently my favorite in the $7.50 uh, thing. If you don't know, the Miller Family Wine Company, millerfamilywines.com, is offering all of our um, our barrel burner, our Ballard Lane, and our Smashberry wines for $7.50 a, a bottle. A lot of these wines are 90 to 92 point wines and gold medal award winners. Go to Miller Family Wines and uh, check it out. Uh, the DD50 promo code should get you $10 a case shipping. And you will also notice Boom, 2016 Pinot Blanc. Boom, 2016 uh, Zinfandel mixed case right now. 180 a case for uh, people not in the wine club, 150 a case for those that are. And I'm pushing our direct to consumer folks to give you even a better deal. But for right now, it's still a hell of a good deal at, uh, at, that, at that price point. Wine technology is dominant. All right. Flex tanks for wine versus aging barrels. You know, flex tanks are made out of um, food grade plastic. And we'll talk a little bit about plastic and stainless steel. Um, just because you guys are watching, I will say that number eight in my list, which we're going to do another, we're going to finish the top 10. Um, we're going to be talking about tanks and vessels. And we're going to be talking about stainless steel and stainless steel jacketed. So you can actually cool it or warm it. Uh, we'll be talking about that all the time. And Jean Taylor, one of my favorite women in the northern tier. Actually, you might be my favorite woman. Don't tell uh, uh, Kristen that I tell I said that because um, you sell more wine than her. Oh, did I say that out loud? Um, uh, Jean, who is, a, I believe, either a diplomat or a level three WCT, just got History of the World in Six Glasses by Tom Standage, which is a book that describes how six of the most popular uh, beverages in human history have fundamentally changed humankind. Tea, coffee, beer, wine, spirits, Coca-Cola. Wine Folly book, yes. Oh, no problem, Christy. That's why we record these things. I'm glad you came home and you got home. And uh, thank you for being an essential, uh, an essential employee. We love the fact that our essential employees are taking care of us. 
John, I'm glad you uh, like the explanation of baby fat. Yes, you do. You need to <laughs> you need to get something in the glass. Absolutely. Flower Chardonnay. Dude, nice call. Boy, man, flowers always is one of my favorites. They've taught me so much as a young man. I'd say I would drink most of my flowers, flowers probably before I was 21. What's my nationality? I am um, predominantly English, Welsh, and German. So the Hagen, Hagen part comes from German, but um, I've got a lot of English and Welsh. If I had more Welsh, I would have a more beautiful voice. Before my voice changed, I had an incredible, uh, an incredible singing voice. Now I can barely get away with um, maybe some um, sing along to like uh, Counting Crows or Grateful Dead. I'm glad you enjoyed the show tonight, Bob. And thank you, Gene. Oh, Gene, you're to me. You're you're so you're a uh, a certified sommelier. To me, you're closer to a master. Thank you, everybody, for coming in tonight. I am going to uh, cook a little uh, dinner for my wife and I. Uh, tomorrow, I will be sore by the time I get online. Uh, what are we doing tomorrow? Uh, I think we're talking a little bit. I will post the exact nature of our show tomorrow to keep it fresh. And until then, I hope that you take care of each other. Remember to find someone in your community that needs your help. Find someone in your friends, uh, you know, your, your uh, circle of friends that need some help and find someone in your family that needs some help and reach out to them. Uh, make sure that, uh, that you love everyone around you and take the love of the people that maybe we've lost this year and throw it back into the world. And remember to love the wine you're with, love the one you're with, and to remember to be kind and to encourage human flourishing wherever you go. I hope you all had a wonderful night, and we will see you tomorrow at 445. Have a great day, guys.